SpaceX will soon kick off the first orbital test flight of its gigantic Starship and Super Heavy booster. The latest reports from various sources and tweets from Elon Musk hint that the mission is just days away. Super Heavy Booster 7, placed atop the orbital launch mount on March 29, underwent a cryogenic proof test on Monday, April 3. The test saw methane and oxygen tanks being entirely filled with cryogenic liquid nitrogen in about one and a half hours. The test not only verified the structural integrity of the booster ahead of the test flight, but also ensured that the orbital launch mount, which had received several upgrades over the past four weeks, was performing its duty as expected. The booster was detanked 30 minutes after fully loading, concluding the final Booster 7 cryoproof test. A few hours before Monday's cryoproof test, SpaceX performed Booster 7 grid fin movement tests to make sure the fins that stabilize the booster during atmospheric re-entry are functioning as anticipated. The grid fin test was monitored by SpaceX engineers with the help of the cameras mounted on the launch tower arms. Several launch mount FireX tests were also conducted during the past few days. For those unfamiliar, the Fire Extinguisher and Detonation Suppression System, or FireX, is designed to purge the orbital launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, effectively cleaning and preventing any volatile mixtures of methane and oxygen underneath the pad before engine ignition. This system is implemented to prevent incidents such as the one that happened during the spin prime test of Booster 7 on July 11 last year. Starship 24, which had been undergoing the final round of pre-launch preparations at the production site for the past two months, was transported to the launch site on April 1. The first attempt to stack Ship 24 atop Booster 7 early Wednesday morning was aborted due to a dangling cable. The next stacking attempt occurred 20 minutes later, and after some struggles, Ship 24 finally rested on top of Booster 7. Unless something unusual happens in the coming days that force SpaceX to de-stack Ship 24, this might be the final full stack before the launch. Starship quick disconnect mechanism tests involving a slow connection to Ship 24, followed by a full speed disconnection, were performed on the day of the full stack, ensuring the mechanism works as expected. The quick disconnect mechanism allows the flow of propellants, gases, electric power, and communication signals to the rocket, and it will disconnect from the vehicle just before liftoff. According to SpaceX, team is working towards a launch rehearsal next week, followed by Starship's first integrated flight test. The Federal Aviation Administration announced on April 4 that Starship's anticipated launch date is April 10, with backup dates on April 11 and April 12. However, on April 6 the FAA updated the launch date, and the agency website now indicates that SpaceX may attempt the launch as early as April 17, during a three-hour launch window that opens at 12 p.m. UTC. Backup launch dates from April 18 to 21 are also available with the same three-hour launch window. An order to close Boca Chica Beach and State Highway 4 on April 11 with backup dates 12th and 13th for non-flight test activity has been published on the Cameron County website. It's highly likely that SpaceX will perform another full-stack wet dress rehearsal ahead of the test flight. While the flight test is approaching, the FAA has yet to issue SpaceX a license to launch Starship into orbit. According to the sources of Christian Davenport, a space reporter at the Washington Post, the launch license is very near, as the FAA safety evaluation is complete and the legal review is underway, but there is an environmental issue to close out. However, Ars Technica science editor Eric Berger pointed out on Twitter that there is a chance that a civil lawsuit regarding environmental problems will be filed immediately following the issuance of the launch license. A court in this situation could order a temporary injunction to stop the flight test until the civil lawsuit is settled. The first launches of the new vehicles are inherently risky, a concern magnified by the sheer scale of Starship. The flight will originate from the Starbase launch site, and the booster stage will separate approximately 170 seconds into the flight. It will then perform a return flight and land in the Gulf of Mexico, approximately 30 kilometers from the shore. The orbital Starship will continue flying between the Florida Straits. It will achieve orbit until performing a powered targeted landing approximately 100 kilometers off the northwest coast of Kauai in a soft ocean landing. Musk said recently that Starship has about a 50% chance of success on its debut try. Authorities have announced navigation warning areas stretching into the Gulf of Mexico, including a marine hazard zone assumed to be for the super heavy impact. There is also a 2300 nautical mile long debris alert zone in the Pacific. A temporary flight restriction has also been posted for Mexican airspace to warn aviators of the launch of Starship. Teams at Starbase have begun clearing the launch site ahead of the orbital mission. The Super Heavy Booster Engine Installation Stand was moved from the launch site to the build site on Tuesday night. This indicates that all 33 engines of Booster 7 are fully ready to fire on the launch day. 
If all goes according to plan, those 33 engines will make Starship the world's most powerful rocket. Russia's N-1 rocket currently holds the record for the most powerful rocket ever launched, but the vehicle flew just four missions in its short life, all of which ended in failure. John Inspruker, a longtime SpaceX employee and live stream commentator, is working on webcast rehearsals, meaning the media team at SpaceX is also gearing up for coverage. Starship 26 recently received all six of its Raptor engines at the build site. The ship, which has successfully completed two cryoproof tests, will now enter the static fire test campaign. The aft section of Starship 28 was moved into the high bay on Wednesday morning. The ship was fully stacked on Thursday morning and used a different stacking order than previous ships. Please check out my previous update to learn why Ship 28 was stacked in a new stacking order. Link in the description. Construction of sections of the second Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center continues at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Installation of subcoolers near the Starship launch tower at Pad 39A is underway. They are used to chill the propellants before they are pumped into the ship and booster. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. The Indian Space Research Organization successfully completed the reusable launch vehicle autonomous landing mission past week. The miniature version of the reusable launch vehicle took off on April 2 by an Indian Air Force helicopter as an underslung load from an aeronautical test range. The vehicle was then released from an altitude of 4.5 kilometers, and according to ISRO, the release conditions included 10 parameters covering position, velocity, altitude, body rates, etc. The flight was autonomous, and the vehicle performed approach and landing maneuvers using the integrated navigation, guidance, and control system. The vehicle eventually completed an autonomous landing on an airstrip, and the conditions assessed during the test, like the space plane's high landing speed of 350 kilometers per hour mimic those that a launch vehicle would encounter upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere from orbit. Reusable launch vehicle is ISRO's attempt at developing essential technologies for a fully reusable launch vehicle to enable low-cost access to space. The space plane looks similar to NASA's space shuttle, which has flown 135 missions. The April 2nd test was the second of four tests designed to get the reusable launch vehicle space ready. The first test, the hypersonic flight experiment, was performed in May 2016. During that test, a 1.5-ton space plane prototype was launched atop an HS-9 rocket, which deposited the vehicle into Earth's lower atmosphere. ISRO declared that short mission a success when the plane splashed into its predetermined spot in the Bay of Bengal. The first experiment did not test the launch vehicle's ability to land on a runway, which became the focus of this latest mission nearly seven years later. ISRO developed a reusable launch vehicle to serve as a test bed for hypersonic flight, autonomous landing, and cruise flight. Future versions of the vehicle will be scaled up and serve as the first stage of a reusable two-stage orbital launch vehicle in order for India to enable low-cost access to space. NASA and the Canadian Space Agency announced the four astronauts who will travel around the moon on Artemis II, the first crewed mission on NASA's path to establishing a long-term presence on the moon. At a ceremony on Monday in Houston, NASA announced that the Artemis III crew members would include NASA's Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Koch, and Jeremy Hansen of the Canadian Space Agency. Wiseman, who will serve as commander of the Artemis II mission, is a 47-year-old decorated naval aviator and test pilot who was first selected to be a NASA astronaut in 2009. He has completed one prior space flight, a 165-day trip to the International Space Station that launched aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket in 2014. Glover, who will serve as pilot, is a 46-year-old naval aviator who returned to Earth from his first space flight in 2021 after piloting SpaceX's Crew-2 mission and spending nearly six months aboard the International Space Station. Mission specialist Christina Koch is a 44-year-old veteran of six spacewalks, including the first all-female spacewalk in 2019. She holds the record for the longest single space flight by a woman, with a total of 328 days in space. 47-year-old Hansen is a fighter pilot selected by the Canadian Space Agency for astronaut training in 2009. He will serve as one of the Artemis II mission specialists and be the first Canadian to travel to deep space. Artemis II is currently scheduled to launch no earlier than November 2024 on the second flight of the Space Launch System rocket. The SLS will place the Orion spacecraft into an elliptical Earth orbit, where it will stay for about a day while astronauts test the spacecraft and confirm its life support systems and other key subsystems are performing as expected. Once the tests are complete, the Orion will fire its main engine to place the spacecraft on a free return trajectory around the Moon. 
Orion will fly approximately 10,400 kilometers beyond the Moon to complete a lunar flyby before heading back to Earth to splash down in the Pacific Ocean. The whole mission is scheduled to last about 10 days. NASA will test a wide range of new technologies, systems, and procedures during Artemis II, just as it did with Artemis I. Many of these have never been tested in an actual spaceflight environment, and the agency will need to collect data to plan future missions of the Artemis program. Artemis II is expected to pave the way for the Artemis III mission later this decade, which will mark the first time humans have touched down on the moon since the Apollo program ended in 1972. SpaceX launched two space missions in the past week. A Falcon 9 rocket topped with 10 spacecraft for the Space Force's Space Development Agency lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base on April 2 on a mission dubbed Tranche Zero. SpaceX first attempted to launch this mission on March 30, but the launch was aborted three seconds before liftoff because of an automatic abort triggered by one of the nine first-stage Merlin engines. Abort, abort, abort. Launch abort is running. The first stage booster that had previously launched a batch of Starlink Internet satellites successfully touched down at Vandenberg's landing zone 4 just under eight minutes after liftoff. At the request of the Space Development Agency, SpaceX did not broadcast live views of the satellite separation and ended the webcast shortly after the booster landing. The 10 Tranche Zero satellites launched were the first members of the proliferated warfighter space architecture, a constellation the Space Development Agency will assemble in low Earth orbit. The entire Tranche Zero constellation will consist of 28 satellites, 20 for data transport and 8 for missile tracking. The satellites will fly in two orbital planes at an altitude of approximately 1,000 kilometers. Another Tranche Zero satellite batch is expected to launch in June. The second Falcon 9 mission of the past week lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on April 7, carrying the Intelsat 40E satellite to space. It was SpaceX's 23rd launch of 2023. After separating from the upper stage, the Falcon 9's first stage making its fourth flight successfully landed on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. Intelsat 40E was deployed into a geostationary transfer orbit from the upper stage of the rocket 32 minutes after liftoff. In the coming days and weeks, the satellite will use its onboard thrusters to move into a geostationary orbit nearly 36,000 kilometers above Earth to begin a 15-year mission providing KU band and KU band communications services. The 5,400 kg spacecraft, built by Makeser, will orbit over the equator at 91 degrees west longitude, giving it a view of North America 24 hours per day. NASA's tropospheric emissions monitoring of pollution, or TEMPO, instrument is attached to the Intelsat 40E. It will scan North America to measure pollutants in the atmosphere, collecting data for scientists to study how concentrations of chemicals produced from human activity and natural processes change throughout the day. The next Falcon 9 mission, dubbed Transporter 7, a dedicated small sat rideshare mission, will lift off from Vandenberg Space Force Base on April 11th. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.